Tak dobré ráno. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, governor, dean and vice dean, all the representatives of the university and all the participants of the discussion forum of Czech National Bank, which is being organized together with the Faculty of Economics and Administration in Brno. Czech National Bank is trying to open up more to the public. It presents its work and activities and also talks about its tasks in those difficult times. I would like to thank all of you that you are being a part of this discussion. Thank you, all of you who are being present in the aula of the Masaryk University. And thank you, everyone who is watching this discussion on the stream of the Czech National Bank, because you have the opportunity to follow the stream as well. And the stream is being translated into English. That's going to run parallel on the website of the Czech National Bank. To start with, let me introduce the Faculty of Economics and Administration. It was founded in 1991 as the very first faculty of Masaryk University after the revolution. There are about 3,000 students here studying both in Czech and English. You can spend part of your studies abroad, and you can even get a second diploma abroad. The faculty offers a high quality education and provides a good opportunity for the students after they finish their degree. They have excellent opportunities on the market and they can be a part of various scientific institutions later. Regarding the Czech National Bank, of course, you can get to know the bank not only during this discussion forum, but also in the lobby. There are two stands, and one of them presents the Czech National Bank as an employer. Because Czech National Bank, when there are surveys being carried out among students, Czech National Bank is one of the top leaders as a favorite employer. So if you feel like it, there are people from the HR department of the Czech National Bank. They are ready for you and they can explain you what the job offer looks like at the moment. And if you provide them with your contact data, you can even win something, a package with a silver coin with a picture of Božena Němcová on it. Or you can win a 100 crown note from the year 1931. There are six packages that you can win all together. So if you provide your contact data, you can win something. So use the opportunity in the break between the two panels. The second stand of the Czech National Bank in the lobby is the visitor center of the Czech National Bank because in this way, Czech National Bank also wants to open up to the public. You are very welcome to get information at the stand. There are subsidiaries of the visitor center in Prague and in Brno. And the Prague exposition can show you the functioning of the Czech National Bank in a in an entertaining and interactive way. You will find out how the Czech National Bank functions on an everyday basis. And of course, you can see the exposition of pictures from Czech National Bank as well. The visitor center in Brno presents the work of art of Jerzy Harcuga, a glassmaker, and in both subsidiaries, you can see the exposition People and Money. That's an exhibition that provides explanation about the development of monetary history in the Czech Republic. And of course, you can visit the website of the Czech National Bank, www.cnb.cz. Today's discussion forum, to start with, the governor of Czech National Bank is going to talk, that's Mr. Aleš Michal, and the Dean Jiří Špalek is going to welcome you as well. 
You can, of course, ask questions. If you have any questions for the governor, we will have about 15 minutes. And then there will be the first panel, which is called the inflation story, extreme uncertainty and inflation expectations. That's going to be the topic of the first panel. And I'm going to present you the panelists in a moment. I only want to apologize that Eva Zamrazilova cannot be here with us, the deputy governor of Czech National Bank. She's unfortunately ill, but uh, well, there will be another panelist. Of course, you can also create the discussion together with us. Your questions can become a part of the discussion. There are two options. Of course, you can raise your hand and our hostesses will bring a microphone to you. I would only like to ask you to wait for the microphone to arrive and not to start talking because there is a stream on the web page of the Czech National Bank and we want to hear you well. And, of course, the second option that you can see on the screen behind me, that's with the app Slido. You can join us at Slido. You can see the password on the screen and there are already questions coming in. So you can either ask channel questions or specific questions for the panelists. If we won't have time for all the questions, the panelists are going to answer your questions later and you will be able to read the answer to your questions on the website on Czech National Bank. Now, only briefly, after a break, after the first panel, the second panel is going to begin. It is called Responsible Investments where the supervision of Czech National Bank finishes and where the personal responsibility begins. That's a very important topic in respect to the development of inflation in the Czech Republic. And Mr. Ladislav Krochak is going to lead us through the second panel. Now, let me allow, let, allow me to pass the floor to the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Administration of the Masaryk University. Thank you very much. Thank you for the floor. Governor, welcome at the Faculty of Economics of Administration. And thank you all the colleagues uh, from Czech National Bank who came here and joined us. Thank you all the partners and thank all the students because I think this event is especially intended for the students. The opportunity to spend the morning here with you is unique for us. There are two dimensions to this event. The first one is the expression of the Faculty of Economics and Administration and its long-term cooperation with the Czech National Bank. We are a part of the research organized by Czech National Bank. And as has been mentioned before, there are very good relationships between the two institutions. And of course, Czech National Bank is a great partner for the Faculty of Economics and Administration. And this event is an opportunity to find out more from the people who are a part of the research of the Czech National Bank. This is a very interesting opportunity, and I really hope it's going to be interesting for Czech National Bank as well. For us, the professors, it's wonderful to hear feedback from our students and questions. I believe that this morning is going to contribute to the feedback to the bankers. The broad public can express their opinion of the position of Czech National Bank. I don't want to take up too much of your time because we have a busy schedule. I wish you all a wonderful morning. And thanks again. I would like to thank Czech National Bank and the governor, I'm very happy that you joined us and I hope that we are going to organize similar events in the future as well because we can see that it makes sense. Thank you and I wish you a successful day.
Thank you very much. That was Mr. Jiří Špalek, the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Administration. And I would like to ask the Governor, Mr. Aleš Michl, to take the opening floor and start the first part of our agenda. Thank you, Veronika. Dear Vice Deans, dear Dean, dear representatives of the academic ground, and dear students, dear guests, we are really happy to be here with you, and I really appreciate the fact that the pro that the Vice Dean is turning the faculty towards applied research and publications in international journals. I would like to talk about how to achieve a strong currency. Our country needs a strong crown. When we look at the past, at the beginning of 2000, we paid 36 crowns for one euro. There was a big inflow of foreign investments, the trade balance was improving, and the crown was strengthening. Since 2000, during the eight years, it strengthened to 23 crowns per one euro in July 2008. July 2008 was the maximum the crown has reached. In other words, the strongest level against the euro was reached 14 years ago and nothing since then. Since 2008, the, the growing, the value growing trend stopped. Between 2013 and 17, we even had to go through a devaluation, a weakening of the crown. The exchange rate was even weaker than 28 crowns per one euro. The problem is that for that time we switched from export and foreign investment inflows, from hard work and productivity to debts and consumption and this kind of demand economy. A demand economy where we ask the state to solve everything and pay everything. And that in my opinion, needs to be changed. A strong crown should be the basic and long-term priority for the Czech National Bank and for the government. What needs to be done to have a strong crown? What needs to be done to make the crown start growing again as a trend as it had been before 2008. Imagine an, an equation with three variables and unknowns, x, y, and z. This is the strong crown. x plus y is z. And I can define the three variables as the monetary policy, fiscal policy, and the policy of long-term growth to to get a result all these three policies variables x y and z have to interact they need to work in synergy one one only is not enough the first policy leading to the Czech crown let's call it monetary policy affects the economic activity with a delay and this delay is longer than one year and this delay makes the decision making and communication targeting inflation complicated let's assume well if we assume that there is no delay in the transmission then it would be enough to stop raising rates once the core inflation has stabilized or ideally starts going down. But it is not the case in reality. The central bank 
due to this delay of the effect, should stop raising interest rates before the inflation peaks. This academic approach has this problem that the people can see that inflation is high and they may think that interest rates stopped growing, that the central bank is not ready to fight inflation. The incorrect approach would be r to raise interest rates until the cost inflation has turned. This approach means that we have overshot and the recession may be deeper than necessary. We described that very precisely in our paper called Cost Inflation, published last year, written with Professor Jedek. And that's the main reason why we in the central bank, in the two last prognoses, we agreed on setting the new horizon for spring 2024. If the credibility of the central bank is high enough, and ours is in the Czech National Bank, then stopping the interest rates rises before the inflation peaks may not be a problem, but it needs to be explained. So I claim that the interest rates of the Czech National Bank are on a level that they dampen the economic activity and the short-term interest rate is at the highest level since 1999. We have the most strict monetary policy during the last 20 years. The growth of the money in the economy is the aggregate M1, and it has been declining by 6.3%. This is the data for, the, for September 2022. The average during the last four or five years before COVID in 2015 to 19, then M1 was growing by 9.3% on a year-to-year -year basis on average. M2, year on year, has been growing nominally by 5.5%, but when compared with the pre-COVID period, the growth was about 7.8%. If we deflate the monetary aggregates by the consumer price index, then the, the new development in the Czech economy is highly restrictive. When we take loans and define loans as a year-on-year -year change of net new mortgages, then the most recent data is minus 82% year-on-year. In August, it was minus 70%. The year-on-year -year net change for businesses, loans for businesses, it's minus 64%. This shows, these figures show that the demand pressures on the inflation arising from the domestic economy are being mitigated. The household consumption is going down. So the stability of interest rates is the right policy. But I mentioned credibility, and this is about long term consistency and actions instead of words. I must say that in Europe, following Switzerland, we have the biggest foreign exchange reserves. And a strong central bank is and will be and must be the fixed point in the economy for all stakeholders. Monetary policy during the next six years should be relatively strict. I mean, interest rates should be relatively higher than it was six or ten years before COVID. The reason is that we need to motivate businesses and people and the government to save money, to decrease the amount of debt. And this is the first step. This is the first policy leading to this, leading to a strong crown. The second policy leading to a strong crown is the fiscal policy. It was in 2018, for the last time, that inflation reached the target of the Czech National Bank. That was a time 
when public finances showed a surplus. I show you some numbers. In 2017, the public finances surplus was 1.5% of GDP. In 2018, it was 0 0.9. In 2019, there was still a surplus, 0 0.3. This is the Eurostat methodology I'm using. And this is no coincidence. To f win over inflation, we need to coordinate the monetary and fiscal policies. The key question is, will increased inflation, as observed after COVID, be persistent? And the answer does not only depend on our monetary policy, but also on the government's credibility, whether it is willing to stabilize the indebtedness. If the fiscal policy leads to bigger deficits, then the monetary policy cannot ensure by itself permanently low inflation. If the central bank raises rates, it will cause a recession, which, though it, a more relaxed fiscal policy in the demand economy can compensate to businesses, to people, which may again spur inflation. So following all these monetary meetings where we decided to keep the interest rates stable, I said that the next key precondition for the Czech Republic to reach lower inflation is to lower the debt of the country. This financial this good financial order is a way to high rating, a way to the country's credibility as a whole, and a way to a strong crown. The third variable, the third policy leading to the strong crown is long-term growth. The monetary and fiscal policies have tried to dampen the swings of the economic cycles. And during the last three years, both the monetary and fiscal policies were concentrating on short-term fixes of the COVID and lockdowns and all the effects caused by that and by the of the energy crisis. But we must remember that the third parameter, the third variable in the equation is the equation is the variable of long-term economic growth. A long-term growth of the economy depends on the production capacity of the economy and on the supply, on the people, their brains, people like you, who will finish their studies, start working, start coming with ideas. Hard work, the capital, and the technologies that interconnect the capital, the human force, with the economy. So my message is to tell you people should save money to accumulate capital for investments in our country. And I want that the wage growth corresponds to the growth of labor productivity, because this is the only way to increase the demand and the potential of this country and the economy can grow non-inflationary. And if there is less debt, then this there will not be that much money in the economy. And that is another precondition for lowering inflation. And as a consequence, when defined this way, the economy should attract direct foreign investments, exports should be doing well, the Czech crown should be desired, and the result will be, this is, this is my message, a strong crown. Thank you very much. So let's proceed with the agenda. Let's introduce the participants of the first panel. Let's move the debate on the professional level and private sector, because we also have the representatives of businesses. Thank you very much. Have a very good day. Thank you.
poprosím, jestli by k nám... I would like to ask the panelists to join us, Mr. Petr Král, the head of monetary section of CNB. Then let me welcome Michal Skořepa, the, co- the economist of Česká spořitelná and member of the board of the Czech Economic Society. The next panelist is Jan Čapek, assistant professor of the Chair of Economy of the Faculty of Economics and Administration of the Masaryk University, and a representative of the private sector, Mr. Rade Nešleha, the director of the companies Edwards and Atlas Kopko Services. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and I would like to ask Mr. Kral to have the opening word. Thank you for the floor. I wish you a beautiful morning, ladies and gentlemen. My presentation in the first panel is going to uncover the background of Czech inflation, which is, of course, the problem number one for the broad public as well as for businesses. This year will go into history as a year in which the Czech economy had to face the biggest inflation pressure in its history. The cost pressure from abroad is culminating or past its peak, and the economy of the Czech Republic had to face demand inflation as well that was influenced by COVID-19 and post-COVID development of the Czech Republic. This development of inflation pressure leads to the fact that the purchase power of households and businesses is being reduced. There is a lower readiness to spend money on investments together with the foreign policy and uh, situation on the foreign market, it leads to the fact that after the Czech Republic was growing steadily for many years, it started to slow down. And the third quarter of this year shows already a fall in our GDP. The labor market was under very unpleasant conditions this year and it is not balanced yet. The inflation as such, I mean the year-on-year growth of consumer prices, reached 18% in September, and in October the growth slowed down. However, it was due to the effect of statistics in the savings tariff that was the contribution of the state to the households regarding energy payments, and then, of course, also a part of renewable energy sources. We can't really overvalue this effect and perceive this drop from 18 to 15 percent and expect that the year inflation is over. That was my negative news. I know it's not very encouraging, but my message is that the inflation should culminate at the turn of this and next year. And in the next year, the inflation should fall below 10%. That should be reached around half of 2023, and it should keep keep falling. The governor mentioned that we want to return back to the great values from the history. This drop of inflation rate is going to be influenced by pressure from abroad on the background of anti-inflation policies in the Czech Republic. That is why we expect that the development of consumer prices is going to slow down, and at the same time, the growth in energy prices, food, and other commodities is going to slow down as well. The dynamics of input rent, this is the cost on housing. We saw the 
rise that was very dynamic in the past three quarters of the year. Of course, the prices of stock exchange is uh, is rising as well, and the real estate prices are soaring, but the rise is being slowing down at this very moment. So we expect that the prices are going to fall in the future. Looking at the details of inflation growth in October 2022, we really have to look into the prices of commodities and services that are being part of the inflation rate in the Czech Republic by about a half. The growth of regulated prices is being very fast as well. That means especially energy, natural gas and heating prices. Food prices are growing as well and they reflect the increased dynamics of commodities on foreign markets impacted by war in Ukraine. Of course, Ukraine is a very significant exporter of uh, various products. Uh, such as cereals. So the war influenced the market globally. The state distribution for energy in the form of a savings fee that was a difference that reduced the inflation by 3.5%. So we see that the statistics biased the end result of the inflation rate by 3.5%. This contribution for the households is going to run until the end of this year. And then we are going to have other measures that should help the households with the rising energy prices and gas prices. Maybe you remember that in November and December last year, uh, GDP for energy and gas was not being charged by the government. And this is also another impact on statistics data. Year to year, inflation rate is going to be very volatile at the end of this year due to those factors. I mentioned the core inflation, which is the major part of the inflation that reflects the impact of economy influences, which can be divided into tradables and non-tradables, especially services. Now, from the year-on-year -year perspective, we can see that the elements of this growth have been fastening. However, only the tradable part is growing now, and the non-tradable part is slowing down. When we take a look at the price movement in both of those segments and the cyclical part of inflation, we can see the momentum of inflation. And this shows that both elements of the core inflation have already passed their peak. Regarding tradables, the growth was very broad up till now. You can see the categories of uh, various prices in the graphics. And the same goes for services. We see the input rent, which is peaking here. But of course, we saw a growth in restaurants, cafes, in culture, spending free time and services regarding personal care, etc. So this was a general growth in the entire Czech economy. Last year, we paid a lot of attention to finding out what part of inflation is connected with cost pressure from outside, external cost pressure, and which part of inflation is due to domestic resources. 
we have an analysis that is being described in our report regarding monetary politics. This report shows that a part of the consumer basket is very closely bound to the situation on the labor market. And uh, the case was that where the correlation is the closest between the labor market and the price fluctuation, we saw that the movement in prices was above average most of the time. We want to supply this core inflation or demand-based inflation. When we take a look at the consumer basket, we observe the correlation with the labor market prices. And then there is this time order that is being an equation of the demand-based inflation. And the graphics shows that the acceleration of inflation this year was caused by inflation pressure, especially energy prices, but also prices of material and other commodities. However, the supply-based inflation increased as well, but it already reached its peak, and it seems that in the third quarter it was already mitigated, it already slowed down. I would also like to use the analysis of a member of Fed, Mr. Shapiro, who breaks down the price movements between cost-based and demand-based inflation. So we saw that the pressure culminated in the second quarter and it is already slowing down. That was an ad hoc perspective, an empiric perspective on inflation from the past months. However, to calculate the pressure of on inflation in economy, we use a calculation model called G3+. Plus. Maybe you know it from our economic papers. In this calculation model, we describe the price development and mention the costs in the consumer sector. The main factors are import prices and prices of domestic production. You see in the graphics below that the culmination of the inflation pressure in the consumer sector was incredibly high, at least in this time frame that we see here. And it culminated in the second half of this year. You can see the yellow contributions. Those are import prices of energy. And of course, they are being contributed by core prices, imported core commodities that are being related to the Eurozone countries. The prices of domestic production that show the, the extent of pressure on households were increased as well. However, from the structural perspective, we can see that they already passed the peak. The extent of inflation pressure in the Czech Republic is a combination of labor prices, effect, effectivity of labor, and we see that the capital contributions that are being approximated to the cyclical character of the economy are being very volatile. However, the dynamics of wages in economy is still relatively stable and pro-inflation. The efficiency of labor that mitigates the price effects of production factors uh, showed a very non-standard development lately as well. This was related to the time of COVID and post-COVID, where, as you know, that the functionality of labor was uh, in a very complicated and difficult situation. Both graphics show that we can expect that from fundamental reasons and from the relations between the domestic and foreign pressure, we can assume that the inflation is going to drop significantly and very fast in the next year. Even though the domestic wage development is going to be quite stiff 
and we will perceive the dynamics of wage growth around 7 to 8 percent, as we saw in the graphics below in the blue color. The wages won't move a lot. So much about the costs. However, consumer prices are being influenced by margins of service providers as well. And we can see that the filtration of economic data shows that the margin gap opened and shows positive values. So it reached above normal value. And we can see that the margins of businesses contributed to the growth of prices and input prices. We saw that after COVID, when the economy opened, where we were very euphoric to be able to return back to shopping and consuming goods, that was at a time when households had a lot of unspent finances that they could invest on the consumer market after the pandemic. And of course, the businesses were aware of that. And the businesses wanted to compensate for lost proceeds from the pandemic. I will sum up very briefly that the Czech inflation and its story shows that it's quite similar as in the neighboring countries. However, the intensity of the price movement in the Czech Republic is unique in some aspects. You can see that there is a part of the consumer basket, and there are some parts of the consumer basket that grow earlier than other parts. And you can see it in the example of the Czech Republic that there is a price of the consumer basket that grows by, by more than 10% in prices compared to other countries such as Switzerland and France. And we are very similar to countries such as Slovenia or the Baltic countries. Regarding the intensity of price growth in the consumer categories, was during the, the summer, because we carried out this survey during summer, and the data is from June. You see that the inflation intensity is very high, and we had this record speed of growth, for example, in restaurants, shoes, etc., in those categories of the consumer basket. You can see all the categories with the exact data on the website of the Czech National Bank. The analysis also confirmed that the core element of inflation in the Czech Republic did not differ much from the growth of consumer prices. And even other economy indicators, such as median inflation or trimmed inflation, are not very different from those values. It seems that all is connected what, with what the governor already mentioned. The fiscal policy combined with the pressure on the labor market and a very fast growth of credits and uh, dis disposable rent of households explains why the Czech inflation was above the average of the European Union. My panel, my other panelists, my colleagues in the panel are going to touch upon topics regarding inflation expectations of businesses. So far, we can't really contradict the assumption that the inflation expectations are being very rooted in our society. We keep following this topic. And regarding the inflation expectations, we follow them both from households, businesses, and on the financial market. The coming inflation drop from the point of view of macroeconomy, we want to reach a mild recession in the next year, and we expect a drop in GDP by 0.7%. So this is going to lead to the fact that the, the overheating economy and labor market are going to cool down as well. 
and until 2024, we should recover and uh, start growing again. The Czech labor market is being very tense is still under pressure. We have the lowest unemployment rate in OECD countries and European Union. However, we expect that the employment rate is going to stop very soon, and maybe the unemployment could turn or rise from 12, uh, from 2% to somewhere below 4% in the coming years. That's our expectation. The empiric part of the analysis shows that the labor market is cooling down. However, we are trying to reach a balance. This cooling down is going to continue, and at the end of the year 2024, we should reach a neutral setting on the labor market. Regarding the wages development, this is just an estimation of expected results of collective bargaining in businesses and state sphere. This is not a recommended value, n not something that the Czech National Bank recommends. We expect that the wages are going to grow in the future because we will compensate for this rising inflation from the past months. And of course, the bargaining position of employees is going to be quite strong before the businesses realize that the demand is going to rise as well. They will want to keep their teams, keep their employees, and they will agree to some of the demands of their employees. However, the wages can't rise too much in businesses because there are other factors that put businesses under pressure. And of course, there are some problems in the production chains. And this is going to be complemented by very negative sentiments in the business sphere, because of course, we are well aware of the fact that we are reaching a recession in our economy. I don't think that we need to sum up what I've said so far. And I would like to thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your presentation. For the start of the discussion, I would like to give you some room to address some of the topics mentioned here. The other panelists can give their opinions before we start the discussion. Maybe Mr. Skotepa could begin. Well, thank you for the invitation. I think that the organizers prepared a great event, and I'm very grateful that so many of you arrived. I'm really, I feel that uh, I'm almost <coughs> someone like David Bowie or Tomasz Klus, uh, that famous. But at this moment, I would really like to point out uh, those very interesting ideas that we heard from Mr. Kral. We want to really find our way in what is going in around us. And we really ask ourselves if we are so different from the rest of the world. Because in the past, I think that the Czech National Bank was being assaulted quite often. People addressed us and asked, well, you are absolutely crazy. The rest of the world does something in a completely different way. So also based on this pressure, on CNB, I think that the central bank is doing very well, is very successful, and I would like to praise that here. And I think this is not quite a standard. I think that the governor mentioned it correctly. We need to communicate and be transparent. That's essential. Maybe not everyone realizes that, but the more open the communication is, the better it is. And maybe this is sometimes in the genes, in the DNA of, of Czech National Bank. And this can be very controversial because it really shows you in the open and transparent communication even some things that should not be shown because you can be criticized for for some actions, but I think that is about everything that I wanted to say at this moment. 
Okay, maybe Mr. Chapek could say something as well. Maybe uh, be brief so that we have time for the following discussion. I would like to thank you for your presentation that clarified many topics and answered many questions. If I should focus on another topic for further discussion, there was one thing not mentioned, and I would like to involve it as well. The data that we saw here came from the last prognosis, and this forecast is consistent with the rise of uh, market interest rates. So the question of the rise in interest rates could be also a part of the following discussion. And then the second thing that was very interesting for me and maybe could lead to a fruitful discussion are the expectations of inflation. We saw some data and some graphics, but when we take a look at the specific data from all relevant entities, the inflation expectations regarding monetary policy are above the price range. So maybe this is an open spot for further discussion. And maybe even a question for Mr. Nishleha, because this also affects businesses and private sector, not just inflation expectations of the households, but also the, the stance of businesses is very important. Are your expectations on inflation changing? I would also like to thank for the invitation first and uh, welcome all of you. I think this is fantastic that we can discuss here in such a way because I think it's very important to explain and communicate why the Czech National Bank is doing what it's doing and in what way. And I think the inflation expectations are very much related to the fact or to the mode of communication, in fact. How are we talking about what's going to happen in the future? And a lot of expectations are based on the opinions of the public and their expectations. So it's quite complicated to find our own way and to adapt to all the pressure on costs. The, the future expectations, if there are positive, because we expect the inflation to drop, of course, this is also related to our planning of businesses, and I can't really answer exactly what our expectation is. Se jí často někteří vyspívali nebo se divili, proč se to děje. Vidíme, že některé centrální banky teď ten trend dohání. Ale spíš mě v téhle souvislosti napadá, je pro Česko v tuhle chvíli výhoda, že si svou politiku a, a, svou, a své nastavení kurzu, ale i nastavení úrokových sazeb řídí sama. Tudíž máme českou korunu, nemáme euro, nebo by pro nás v danou chvíli bylo výhodnější být součástí eurozóny. Když vidíme, pro jak v různě rozdílné ekonomické situaci členské státy, teď ECB vlastně úrokové sazby nastavuje, protože po Balcké republiky vysoká inflace kolem 20%, ale pak je tam také Španělsko, je tam Francie, které mají inflaci kolem 7%. Je to pro nás teď výhoda? Tak... Uh... Důležitý aspekt té vaší otázky je to ta, ten důraz na to teď. E, protože ta otázka přijetí eura má mnohem jako širší e, aspekt, širší kontext. A k tomu bych se teď nerad vyjadřoval, to je konec konců politické rozhodnutí, ale čistě e, z hlediska e, pozice ekonomiky v cyklu a boje proti inflaci by pro nás teď měnová politika Evropské centrální banky znamenala, že by měnové podmínky nebyly dostatečně přísné a podobně jako země pobalské, a podobně jako zřejmě Slovensko v příštím roce by ta inflace eskalovala ještě na vyšší hodnoty, než je tomu u nás, než tomu bude u nás, protože u nás se skutečně tou včasnou reakcí měnové politiky od loňského června, která pak jako si, jak si nabrala na důrazu během podzimu a jara letošního roku, tak se podle nás podařilo minimálně o 5% bodů snížit ten vrchol té inflace, který by jinak nastal, kdybychom měnovou politiku ponechali dlouhodobě, beze změny, jak se tak až do nedávna dělo v případě Evropské centrální banky. Takže čistě momentálně je ta schopnost používat úrokovou i 
kurzovou část měnových podmínek bez, 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 bez pochyby velkou výhodou České republiky a České národní banky. Pane Skřepo, možná čekáte, že teď ECB dožene to, co možná ztratila tím, že déle vyčkávala. Kristin Lagardová přiznává, že dvouprocentní úrokové sazby nejsou... Mrs. Lagarde admits that the interest rates are not sustainable in the long run. It is not likely that it would be reached the level we have in the Czech Republic. I don't think that is the case. But the ECB, that must have been part of the delay. It is in a more complicated situation than the Czech Central Bank. It is an institution which has, which bears heavier political burden. It is a a pool of countries, each with a different development of the financial markets, the debt. And it took a long time in the ECB to start doing what they are now doing. And that is the key transformation of the world. Until the summer, they had been trying to, to be neutral in the adoption of their instruments when buying bonds, let's buy them in the share of the size of the countries when selling them let's sell them in the same proportion but in the summer they approved they passed a new approach and they even started using this approach now so they start w using different approaches for different countries they are selling german bonds but at the same time buying italian bonds and this is so flagrant an arrival of this funding when the central bank is meddling into the abilities of the countries to fund themselves in a conflict with the long-term management financial management of the country so first it is a problem as such but as for the similarities it is only now when they have passed this that they can screen of the Italians and other countries from the interest rate hikes and so they could start and now they are hiking them again anyway because they see that the most sensitive parts of the Eurozone are screened off by this bond hand sheltering them from the most serious implications of high interest rates I would like to ask a few questions I'm receiving from the slide app there is a, a lot of questions so not to neglect them one part of the questions are about the demand shocks and their impact on the current inflation the question is how much is the relaxed fiscal policy from the COVID time to blame for the high inflation the policy of central banks that made assets grow over spill over into the consumer baskets can we define this not so well the most important factors as we heard in the presentation is the cost and that this this cost comes from the energy so any fiscal policy or irresponsibility would not play a role and then we have demand pressures it could be one third maybe one half of the inflation and the COVID of course had a big impact because these are the savings from the COVID time but on top of that on top of the lockdowns I'm not sure if we could trace back the impact of the fiscal policy and on the domestic demand mr skorepa it has always it has often been the argument that the government was wasteful of course it was trying to support the economy and the households at a time when they were hit by covid especially businesses that had to close down during the first covid waves so that was good but also a lot of other measures that did not have anything to do with COVID were part of that. This was revealed in the audit. Did that play a role in what where we are now at? Of course, it is hard to quantify this role, maybe even impossible because it's 
being mixed with other things to the fiscal support was not structurally balanced when you take the biggest portion which was the cut of the income tax this helped the riches most due to the percentage points and we can see that in the property price growth that was at a record heights when compared with the EU then we were overtaken by Estonia that was over 20 percent that's an eye-whopping number so we can see that here the rich felt even richer and they didn't know what to do with their money anymore and in the environment of the low interest rates it was one of the few destinations where they saw their money could keep its value so there we can see it yes but otherwise I don't know what my colleagues will say but I don't want to just throw a number here on the table but there is an impact yes the question is the future we didn't speak about Kurzarbeit at all that may be on the table during the coming months that companies will be in trouble but before they get in trouble they will raise the wages so the question is how this government will be able to get involved in this process again and try to relieve the situation to both sides so there may be another wave of support like this now the view of business people of course you were hit by COVID I don't know how your company was hit did you have to sack people to stop production did you have less orders what was the situation after COVID before the current crisis stroke especially the energy crisis and also the interest rates as high as they are are affecting you I guess from our point of view fortunately in our company COVID did not have a big impact unlike a lot of other companies but the expectations you talked about that businesses will face trouble in the future but the expectation of the employees the expectation is big regarding the wage growth to catch up with inflation so it will depend how the society how the businesses can face up to this and how they can communicate to the employees what is sustainable for them to in accommodating the growing cost for all of us but also ensuring that the companies will stay competitive and stay on the market in the long run I think this is the most important factor and that's why these discussions are important for the expectations so that we know that there are moments you need to survive and believe that it will change for the better you mentioned these pressures coming from your employees that they want higher wages due to the high inflation this is one of the biggest concerns of the Czech National Bank that the wage inflation spiral will start spinning the governor said they could remove the inflationary clause from the agreements and that the wages would grow by less than five percent how successful are you in these negotiations this is very hard to comment the negotiations are still underway and we don't know the numbers yet how we will respond to the inflation we are now discussing this and we will communicate this towards our employees during the next weeks it's very important to see the example of the Czech National Bank there is nothing worse in my opinion than when some companies or state state authorities increase salaries and stimulate the high expectations and these expectations are not realistic or can be bad in the long run because the companies will not be able to bear it due to all these other costs due to high energies energy prices input materials 
let me speculate a little bit on a more general level. I'll try to suggest how high the wage pressure will be and to offer one clarification why the inflation is so high. It feels a bit like in the Czech Republic the population hasn't really learned to live in the market economy. I have two personal experiences. Last year I was hiking in the mountains and I saw repeatedly how people are coming to their cottages and they are realizing that this fried cheese costs 180 crowns. So the inflict the expectation was maybe 130, 150, but then they see 180 and say, well, what can we do? We must pay this. So they are not used to fight it by saying, I will not buy it. I'll run hungry or I take a snack or I'll check it online before coming. We let it like fall on us. And I think that leads to the fact that we are spending money, accepting the new prices, regardless of the fact that it does not meet our expectations. And we spend the money and we come to a breaking point and say, oh, we now, we now don't have enough even for the basic things. This is a nonlinear thing. The macroeconomic models don't factor in and then the household consumption may, may go down quickly the same situation may be with fuel in March when the war started crude oil got expensive and the prices went up at the gas stations and instead of saying no this is too much I'm not going to pay the margin is too high I will not use the car or I will check if they are selling the gas cheaper somewhere else but instead we just we were coming to the gas stations as usual and told the state you go you come to the refilling station and intervene this is maybe like I said a pure speculation but I think we need to learn in our roles that the market economy is a permanent fight and when things changed abruptly when they got out of balance this is the moment we need to realize that we have certain budgets and we need to protect our financial stability and not just accept it like okay what can we do it is always painful to reduce your living standard the society can hardly cope with that and it is very hard politically to push through. The reality is what it is then. Yeah, it was. This is the story of the current demand inflation. A story which got even more complicated because the people and the households have savings from the COVID time. So the people accept a price that is beyond their inflationary expectations. That can happen if you have savings, but when you have run out of the savings, is that not the acceptance of higher inflation expectations? That you have already done the transaction. It By buying the item, you are accepting the price level and this is the additional problem I talked about. Also for the monetary policy, because this is already moving the inflation expectations. Yes, but then I would expect a similar reaction also on the side of wages. That people will fight more to be able to have the money. They will go onto, onto the streets. There will be tens of thousands of people in the demonstrations, the demonstration on Wednesday attracted a few thousand of people. It was not like a strike, but it was close to an effort to show that we don't have enough money, we don't make enough money. This is also our incomplete ability to fight for ourselves and make more pressure on the other party. Of course, regarding the economic stability, this may be beneficial if we did it in the French way, that they are striking half a year 
risk, then the wages would be maybe growing 10 to 15 percent, but that would be very bad. Let's not call for it. You talked about inflation expectations, Mr. Kral. I also felt like everything is expensive and we are accepting it, that there is this tendency. People, people are not happy, but it is really going on in the society. How much should we raise a finger? How can the Czech National Bank, but maybe even the government, intervene also against this enormous growth of margins? This is going on. A lot of businesses, I don't assume that your business too, but a lot of businesses are trying to make extra money. Of course, the inputs are growing to everybody, not in the same manner in every industry. And if they know that there are high inflation expectations, they are logically trying to become richer. Can we face this? Well, this makes all sense, right, as we speak about it. But I would like to differentiate between the perceived short-term inflation, and that cannot be different than high. The households see it, 15, 20 percent price increases for the consumer basket. They are concerned, and they don't think this will disappear from one day to the other. So. The inflation expectations for one year are very high, and also we believe it will be 10% in one year from now on. That is still far from, sp from price stability. The question is what the businesses and entrepreneurs and households think about the inflation past this horizon where we can see. And this is the period not many people know much about. and. Assumptions dominate over expectations or prognosis. So let's say what happens in three years. I don't know what there will be with China, Germany, with the economy, with gas. But I think the central bank will play its part and inflation will be close to 2%. Because I believe it. I have trust in monetary policy. I have trust in the credibility of the inflation target. And when this belief stays in our minds, the central bank has won, because that means that within three years, there will be nothing fundamental preventing the gradual drop in inflation until reaching the target. If we realize that inflation thinking has changed, and they would say, I don't know what happens in three years, but it will never be as low as it was because the government will be spending money, the central bank will not do its job, no central bank in the world will do its job because it will fear negative reactions. So then we have a big problem, we as economic authorities, because fixing something what has been relaxed is very painful, very challenging, and then we would end up in the 70s when there was a deep, lengthy recession with negative socio-economic impacts and it took many years to reach the price stability so it is better to prevent things like this and demonstrate the ability to act and use acts instead of words and I think the Czech National Bank has done this pretty pretty well since last year and in this kind of environment the likelihood of escalation of the inflation problem is quite low because all shocks tend to die out. The global supply chain will stabilize. The gas price on the global exchange markets will stabilize. Maybe it will not be that low as it was, but it will stop growing. And also the food prices will stop growing. So I think things can get close to stable values un unless we spoil all this with our own inflation thinking where we 
want to see the inflation and prices. So this is a lot about communication, credibility, and the openness of the economic authorities toward towards the public in demonstrating a credible consolidation policy on the part of the fiscal policy, demonstrating the readiness of using monetary tools if needed as much as necessary. So these are the instruments that help stabilize things. And I think the Czech public is pretty uh, very sensitive to constructive economic steps. Mr. Skorepa, Mr. Kral mentioned quite a lot this in those inflation targets of the Czech National Bank. And sometimes we hear information why the Czech National Bank is so careful about it. What would happen if the Czech National Bank would decide that the inflation should get stuck at 3%? So you're asking about the number, about the figure itself. I mean, any increase of inflation target. Well, if it would be a rise from 2 to 3%, I guess that almost nothing would happen. There would be no change because the discussion is very complicated and, of course, it evolves in time. And the central bank gathers information from the past years. And uh, many of you who study economy already saw this in the past. There used to be times when some people claim that zero inflation or maybe slightly negative inflation is the best situation possible. But I think we are already past that. We, we could agree on that. All civilized countries have an inflation rate about 2% or maybe a little higher. And I think it doesn't really matter much if it's 2 or 3%. The question is about the signal, the message that the central bank gives to the public. Maybe people can ask, okay, you have 3% inflation. Does this mean that we are doing bad, that you are no longer able to keep those 2%? Well, then you need to explain a lot and communicate openly. But some experts of the monetary fund proposed to reach the inflation of 4%. So I think when we stay in this range, 2 to 4%, everything is fine. Another question regarding foreign currency handling, because in 2013 to 17, the Czech National Bank wanted to weaken the crown and strengthen the economic growth. And uh, I think that the foreign currency stock was sold at the height of several billion that was this year in March or April, I think. So how can foreign currency stock help the Czech Republic during this time of increased inflation in the short term? Uh, is it an advantage that we have a lot of foreign currency stock? Yes, it's definitely an advantage. We need this reserve of foreign currency that was built up by the Czech National Bank even during the time of privatization of property and the big inflow of foreign capital in the 90s. The members of Bank Board mentioned lately that it's a good thing to have this reserve of foreign currency and the credibility that it gives to the Czech National Bank on the market with foreign currency is very high. This means that CNB has no problems communicating when defending this situation, keeping this stock of foreign currency. Gentlemen, do you think this is an advantage? For us, from your point of view, it has been criticized by many people, even economists, that the Czech National Bank bought a lot of euros and dollars. Well, now, if we would like to fight in inflation, this could be an advantage. We can intervene and stop weakening of the crown. What impact this could have? quantitatively may be compared to some standards or standard tools that we used of the monetary policy. 
Maybe if the Bank Council would reach the decision that we need to fight the inflation even more, maybe the question is to what extent the bank should intervene, if it should even increase the interest rates. That could lead to a very complicated discussion. But now if we would take this step and decide that we would like to decrease the imported inflation, it could happen that the bank could, could intervene and the part of imported inflation could be reduced. And of course, the stock of foreign, foreign currency would come in handy, would be very useful. Okay, we are coming to the end of the discussion. Maybe the last question for Mr. Neschleha. The situation for businesses, uh, well, regarding loans, that's not very simple because businesses need loans and high interest rates impact you as well. Did your approach to money change in any way? Do you see that the situation is worse now? I think it's more complicated for many companies in the Czech Republic, but it's not just about interest rates. It's about the mixture of overall expenditures. We mentioned wages, energy prices, input costs for materials. This is a mixture of all the expenditures, and it's quite complicated for all businesses. I would also like to respond to the question of margins and France and how we should fight. I think that we are in a market economy, and it's only natural that businesses, if they are able to do that, that they use the market. And that is why I agree that we all should behave in such a way that we learn to live on the market and find our place on the market. For me personally, I see that when it comes to the prices of energy and fuel, you can't really well respond to that. But we also need to realize that we are here in the Czech Republic we wanted to stay competitive, not only in the Czech Republic, but also in the larger space. And if we should act like they do in France, I don't think that it would be the right way because we would lose this competitiveness and uh, this advantage for the neighboring countries that we have now, as I think. Thank you very much, all the panelists. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Thank you all the students and the audience that ask the questions. I hope that I mentioned all of them or the most of them, the most important. So, gentlemen, thank you very much, Mr. Kral, Mr. Čapek, Mr. Nešleha, Mr. Skořepa. Thank you, Governor, Mr. Michal, for being here with us as well. We are going to make a break of half an hour and we will meet here again at quarter past 11 after a brief coffee break. And we are going to talk about investments in our second panel. Thank you very much so far. Welcome again at the discussion forum of the Czech National Bank that is being organized together with the Faculty of Economics and Administration of the Masaryk University. Thank you for being with us. If you can't be present here, there is still stream available on the website of the Czech National Bank, both in Czech and in English. And I would also like to remind you that you can form this discussion together with us. We are going to talk about investments in difficult times. And you can ask questions in the app Slido. You can see the password behind me on the screen. So go ahead, please. Let me start the second panel with a sentence that we hear quite often from financial counselors and various institutions of a shady character that are trying to use this difficult times and the situation on the market. Quite often you hear you are certainly trying to fight the inflation. I have a very reliable product for you that can help. So let's try to explain what the Czech National Bank can guarantee, if there is a reliable product that can fight inflation, what entities are under the supervision of Czech National Bank and 
to what extent your supervision can reach. Let's talk about prospects. We will mention several products that look like a miracle on the market, but then later you could find out that many people lost their entire savings that they invested in those so-called reliable products. Can the central bank guarantee any proceeds of investment products at all? We have the following panelists, Mr. Ladislav Krochak, the head of the supervision section over financial market of the Czech National Bank. I'm sorry, I have some troubles with my f microphone. I would like to use the hand mic if possible. Great, problem solved. Let me also welcome Mrs. Jana Bronadi, Executive Director of the Czech Capital Market Association, and Michala Moravcová, Assistant Professor of the Chair of Finance of the Faculty of Economics and Administration of the Masaryk University. I would like to start with the opening presentation. The floor is yours, Mr. Krochak. Thank you for the floor. I wish you a nice afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please let me leave this micro world that was mentioned in the first part of today's discussion and let's look into those micro issues and the micro world now. My presentation is maybe a follow-up of the first topic mentioned here. But as we heard, many households are trying to fight the inflation and they are using various tools to do that. One of them are one of those tools are capital market tools, which is a wonderful opportunity, but it can be very risky. I would like to present several products here. Maybe only a brief introduction of the capital market in the Czech Republic. You can see that the tree of entities is quite large. There are many products here. And of course, there are also foreign funds, almost 2,000 of them, and almost 600 businessmen dealing with foreign titles who can work in the Czech Republic as well. Let's take a look at the capital market structure. I only included the distribution part. And now we are going to divide the, the entities into businessmen and investment funds. When you take a look at the right graphics, you see the development of investment funds is quite stable. Collective investment funds are much more dynamic. They develop in a more dynamic way. And the most dynamics we saw in the qualified investor funds. This means that those are investors that can invest up to 125,000 euros under certain conditions. But of course, this limit can be reduced up to 1 million Czech crowns. So those are very attractive funds that are growing at the moment. Uh, this is also caused by the legislative conditions when the legislation provided appropriate conditions for those funds to be so active on the market. However, we need to protect qualified investors and this protection is not as strong as it was in the past as we perceive it. Now, let's take a look at the dynamics in various funds. Of course, you see the graphics for the qualified investor funds, and you see that the values are in billion of Czech crowns, and I think the figures are very important. However, in the past year, the situation changed due to the development on the market, but there is nothing dramatic that we can see here yet. So we see that the investment funds are growing in the Czech Republic and the number of their clients is growing as well. That's a positive thing. In the past 12 months, we've seen an increase of almost 1 million 
customers. So this is an, a huge number for a country of 10 million inhabitants. Of course, uh, there are overlaps in the statistics because there are many clients who use several products, several funds at the same time. But overall, we notice that Czech households like to invest, which is definitely a good thing, definitely good for the capital market. And when we talk about a product mix to provide for ourselves uh, when you retire, well, when I look around me, I can see that this is not your most urgent topic. Huh? But on the other hand, when we prepare long investment funds, maybe even you will find something interesting, an interesting solution for your age group. So this fund is going to be on the market soon, let's hope. What are the products that a common retail investor can see on the market? Of course, those are collective investments, bonds, shares, derivatives a bit less. Let's hope that for many retail clients, this is not the main product that they want to use. And then I'm going to mention some high risk products. And the clients that chose those products quite often lost all of their savings. The main risks or problems that we face and especially the risk that the market has to face, there is a list of those issues. And the highest risks starting with CFD contract for difference. It is really important to mention that no entity with the license from the Czech National Bank provides nowadays products of this type. They are all provided by foreign entities, and a big part of those investors have a license from Cyprus. Cyprus. But we also have one very active company with a German license. Those products are absolutely unsuitable for common clients. This is more or less gambling. You don't really acquire any commodity or share index. The client speculates that an asset price is going to move. You don't really have the opportunity to wait for a positive price. When the price is being uh, in the negative figures, you don't have time to wait for a better result. That's the biggest problem here in this product. And quite often, people can lose their money very quickly, very suddenly. The Czech National Bank issued a product intervention in 2019, and we limited some parameters of similar products. We wanted to limit the number of savings that you can lose. And we were a bit naive because we thought that if we warn the investors sufficiently, it's going to be enough. The information is obligatory to show what percentage of clients face losses, and it reaches up to 80%. And when we talk to clients who lost hundreds of thousands or even millions of Czech crowns, they admit seeing this information and not being scared. So now we are considering that we should put something different uh, as a warning there. Because, well, it's like when you smoke, when you see a very ugly picture on the cigarette box, you still keep smoking. It does not discourage you. Corporate bond investments, uh, maybe only briefly. Quite often we see that CNB is a very popular marketing brand. If CNB approves of something, then it's a common thing that it should be good. But if we approve of something, it only means that the document includes all the legislative prerequisites. We do not really 
investigate the credibility of an entity or the success rate. So please be very careful here. We also involve a sentence on those financial products if we approve of a product such as a prospect. We issue this warning or notice, but of course, some investors can't be discouraged even by a warning. I also wanted to mention unregulated entities. The Czech legislation involves the opportunity for the issuer to issue their own bonds. Unfortunately, this happens quite a lot. And uh, this causes a lot of issues. I think the most problems that we've seen recently is related to this problem. Quite often, people have a license of the Czech National Bank to distribute some regulated products, for example, insurance or investments. But they have this license and they can provide the clients with some investment products. And they pretend to guess or estimate that the product is there and pass on the contact data to the client. Once you hear the explanation of the product, it just exceeds the competence of the person who provides you with this additional product. And I would discourage you from talking to this person even further because you can't really sell something, a different product that you don't have a license for. You should stick to the products that you are allowed to sell, such as insurance or investments. Because once the clients trust someone, you can pretend to be a contact person for a different entity and recommend a product, but there are no liabilities connected to that. And people lose money very quickly. There is a business that organizes financial awareness courses for the elderly. And at the end of this event, they want to sell those elderly people bonds. So this is a great risk. Please be careful. Another issue or a different type of entities that don't have a very good reputation nowadays, this is Act Number 15. Those are alternative investment funds. You can see that they are being more and more attractive in the past years. Their, their popularity grew a lot. And those are entities that are not under the supervision of the Czech National Bank, not at all. Those entities are only registered. Czech National Bank needs to lead a register with all entities that fulfill general conditions for registration as administrator or trustee of alternative funds. So those entities send once a year, they report on activities that only include several figures. And we do not check this report. We can't even do that because the law forbids us to do this, that, forbids us to do that. And we only prepare an annual summary that we send to ESME. This is a European body that follows the development on every European market. But in case of this Act Number 15, we can quite often see those risky entities that harm their customers, that recommend some specific investments. Maybe you remember some cases. It was called JO Investments or Growing Way. That was a legendary young investor. Now we have VC International. So when we sum up only those three businesses, this is something that generated a loss of six billion Czech crowns. Now providing investment services, cross-border services in particular, we have 
600 businessmen that are registered and are able to provide products, investment products, but only a small part of them are very active. Most of them are businessmen from Cyprus with a license from Cyprus, and uh, they are active in the Czech Republic and provide very risky products to their clients. For example, CFD that I already mentioned. Cross-border investment services. You should be careful. This is nothing wrong about uh, this investment. But if there is a dispute, you should realize that you can't address the dispute to the Czech National Bank. You really have to address the supervisory board of the respective countries in the language of the specific country, or maybe in English. Even though the entities uh, need to follow the conditions of the European legislative, still they need to respect their national legislation. So be careful about that as well. Now, when we talk about other funds, those are mutual funds, and they are perceived as less risky in general. But I think we should be careful here as well. What is important is the time frame. And I will come back to that in a minute when we talk about the time frame of mutual funds. Let's talk about the averages or average values of the four groups group, groups of funds. You can see the volatility in the blue curve. Those are shares. So, for example, if you want to invest for one, two or three years, you should stick to conservative products. You can see the real estate funds which are doing well. If you have more time, maybe you can choose a more aggressive investment strategy. The question of the dynamics of the fund or of the risk of the fund, you can see on the scale below. And you should consider that when you gather the key information regarding each investment, you should be aware of the risk that you go into. What should an investor consider when making an investment? We've mentioned some of the things here. Maybe the client should also understand the product well. That's my recommendation. If you don't understand the mechanism of the investment, if you don't understand how your product functions, you should not invest in it. On the capital market, nothing is guaranteed. If someone guarantees you an investment, you should not trust them. There is nothing that's guaranteed. No proceeds. Of course, you have much more possibilities to invest on the capital market, but you need to understand the principles of the functioning of various products. Otherwise, you could lose a lot of money. Let's get back to the investment time frame. It is one of the most important parameters for me when we consider, for example, DAX, the German index. In the past 30 years, you can see the development on the screen. However, the popularity curve is still rising. And now we are in a stage that let's hope, as we heard from Mr. Kral as well, that is it's going to be corrected a bit. And that this drop that we see at the end of the curve is a signal that everything will go well again. But of course, there are circles around some very vulnerable points that show the volatility of investments. And you should always consider a time frame of an investment. When you start investing and you have a bad timing, you can really do very badly and be surprised. Then, of course, other things such as liquidity of investment tools. When you buy some bonds, the question is whether there is a secondary market, how the price of the bond is being determined, how we are going to work with convertible bonds, for example. 
if you're going to sh going uh, going to receive a share of a company and well if the company is just an empty shell the share of a company company does not mean much so this is all included in the prospect in the conditions of the investment i know that there are maybe 30 pages that you have to read through but this can save you a lot of money it is also important to see what services are provided to you we mentioned several services uh, counseling asset management expenditures etc the provider of investment services uh, how are they being remunerated we should realize how those people are paid sometimes they want to offer you a product or even force a product on you and you should realize what the motivation of the person is this should be also a part of your decision whether to make the investment or not and of course the case is not only in the investment market or on capital market that you should really consider all the aspects and make a decision in calm, not under pressure, because some people claim, no, you need to sign immediately because the prices are going to fall very soon. Please do not accept this. Always leave enough time to make your decision and verify the information from other sources as well. You should verify whether the person is being truthful to you. And of course, an investment interview should be ended with a protocol that you should both sign. And in this protocol, you mention what has been talked through with you. If the person refuses to make such a protocol with you, I do not recommend to go into this investment because this person is not reliable and then it's really hard to prove that you were right when making the investment. It's also important to decide who you are sending your money to, because in case of foreign entities, they are being represented by Czech-speaking people. And then maybe only when you sign the agreement, you find out that this is a company from Cyprus, and then it's maybe too late. What is the role of the Czech National Bank in the supervision? This is the role of a public entity, public authority that should supervise. Of course, we get a lot of hints, a lot of uh, comments from the public that uh, ask us to verify the work of some entities, companies, businesses, but we are not able to provide a compensation for loss. We can't do that. The legislation does not even allow us to do that. We can penalize maybe some subjects or some entities, but we can't really compensate for any losses to the customers. We mostly do remote supervision. That means we process a lot of information and reports starting with public information, clients' complaints, there's a lot of entities, tens of thousands of them, and the, the industries we are overseeing, there's a lot. We play maybe a Europe a unique role. There are not many countries in Europe where the National Bank is also the supervisory body of the whole financial market. There are countries of our size having two or three bodies like that. So this is a bit different here, and that's why we have this risk-oriented approach that means we tip out the risky sectors from the materials available and focus our supervision on them. What can the National Bank do when we have realized an offense? What is th So we can impose a f penalty, call for a remedy, or remove the license. Sometimes People say that we are not consequent enough, that we could prevent something. Well, let me say that we can only do what the law allows us and our mandate. We fortunately live in a lawful country, so we need to obey the laws. 
besides this super vision and repressive activity, we also want to educate the public. We have all kinds of information on our website. Maybe there are more attractive websites to read than ours, but if you decide to invest your money, please spend a few minutes reading certain papers. It may help you a lot, or you may also visit the education center. On top of this, we also issue the Ten Commandments, something like commandments. So this is also a user-friendly checklist to read. It can be very useful. Yeah. So this was my presentation. Thank you for listening. We are on a university ground. So let me say at the end that the best protection of a client is his or her own knowledge. Thank you. And that's why our hall is full. We want to upgrade our investment knowledge. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask Jana Brodani. We heard the most problematic factors that may take our money from us, a, a well-meant investment even. We talked about people who are tipping out the weak links. We talked about investment in investments in corporate bonds and these contracts for differences. In your experience, does this correlate with where you see the biggest risks? Are people really turning to your association? People with similar problems? People who have lost their money? They do, indeed. When I joined the association 15 years ago, during the first month, I had a phone call of a betrayed client, and I was shocked how easy it was for the how easy it was to trick the client. They told him, "You will make 20 percent," and he said, "No, sorry, I don't invest." And then they called a week later. You have look, it is already going up. You have lost so much money. Don't you want to invest now? And he said, "No, I investing is nothing for me." And when they called him for the third time, he sent them one hundred thousand dollars. And I was really shocked how certain pressure techniques work. Also for people who they just withdraw their money from a fixed term account and send it to a foreign account without having the idea to who they are sending it and how so i started looking for the problematic situation it is changing it has changed a lot over what it was 15 years ago more complex and more complicated is it now for the investors? Because Why? Because the worst thing when people succumb to this behavior and they cancel their construction savings account, they take money from their current account and send it to a crypto account or a specific account, but like no diversification, no experience, no skills. It's either everything or nothing. And these are the situations that are most tragic. Nothing happens when I take 5,000 crowns with a huge risk or high speculation. But the problem is when the people speculate and send a lot of money to assets and there this threatens their bare existence. The second problematic situation is inflation. One reason is that we all talk about it. You can almost see it 
in the fairy tales that money is losing its value and you say you I must do something and this is the fertile ground for criminals people who were never interested are now interested and when they have bad luck and come across a criminal the the inflation it's like a magic word and then they come with a good intention they really want to behave as a good manager but they suffer a big loss I have seen a lot that now everybody is an investment expert are we in a country that we are all so rich because there is an investment expert waiting in every cupboard when I see a girl in marketing who takes a three-month evening course and then starts investing in trekking shoes sports shoes so where are we are we really going to be experts and the, the expert skills will be gained by having a lot of followers so I think that inflation is a big word in financial advice and it is good that Kim Kardashian was sanctioned in the US because she was recommending a, recommending a suspicious crypto it could be also here in the civil code there is an interesting provision which I think everybody should know it should be the basic part of our financial literacy if somebody says I'm an expert and recommend something they should also bear the responsibility material responsibility because this is how consultancy is set on the financial market you have a number of instruments who to turn to and if if you are not treated well so this should apply to all self-appointed financial influencers. And the third problem, and here I would like to see the side of the clients more, because we live in a universe with two completely separated parts. One is the regulated one. When a regulated entity comes, then even saying hello must be subject to rules. The National Bank sometimes comments how big the lettering must be, how much you can make, and how big lettering there must be for the risks. These are formalized things. So this is the universe of the regulated world. But next to it, we have something completely unregulated. Anybody can come promise anything in any way. And this creates this distortion, especially in cases that may, from an outsider's point, to be somewhere on the edge. The, the examples I mentioned are problematic because they cause a strong sense of regulation like the prospect was approved by the Czech National Bank we live in a world where the same corporate bond can be offered by a trademan who must make a report and provide all this information but also by this criminal who says this is guaranteed by the Czech National Bank completely safe the return is 10 percent and this is confusing for the people so I think here there is a lot of room for regulation which brings in the regulated sector this is a complex thing the financial market is much more regulated than the food industry or the pharmaceuticals and there are three areas working for the benefit of the client. It's the information. 
It is highly regulated how and what this trade company must tell you. You saw this formalized table of the offer of an investment fund. There was a risk scale, performance, this compulsory information on entities. Then, so this is this awareness or information. The second is that there is the, a structure in place preventing the money to be stolen. Like in investment funds, there is no guarantee of the return. If there shall be a return, there is a risk. You cannot eliminate the risk from an investment, then it would be not an investment. And we couldn't talk about a proceed. But what is guaranteed, that there are several levels protecting your assets. Unlike with these investment, non-investment funds, but administrators according to Section 15. So we must prevent that the person buys this Lamborghini or whatever it was, but that the money is invested in line with the principles so that it is well managed and there is objective responsibility of the depository, which is the bank or the trading company, that the funds are managed as promised. The third level is the supervision of the Czech National Bank over whether the money has not been somehow lost, whether the entity does everything what it is supposed to do. And this is all about financial regulation. To wrap it up, it would be great to prevent situations where it is not clear to the people if they are in the regulated part where they are protected throughout the process, protected from the loss of their of all their assets so that they know where they are compared with the other non-regulated part where they have no protection whatsoever. Maybe I would follow up we heard how far the hand of the Czech National Bank reaches only as far as the law allows. Is there room for making it stricter? And then we have been receiving questions from the app, like Mrs. Brodani said, that these criminals and people trying to betray you to steal your money, if they should be punished be it the funds or if they should bear financial responsibility. I mean also people who offer these products and may bring you to a loss. Would this help make the investment market more transparent also in the current situation, which is not easy? People are trying to protect their money and the standard products available that are taken as safe, these instruments do not pretend protect your money against inflation. Well, we said we have two different worlds. I think the solution, we should seek the solution in the right identification for the investor so that they can find their way through this world. There are hints and guidelines, but the problem is that the the sphere outside the strong supervision of the Czech National Bank is using the arguments of the Czech National Bank for its benefit. We talked this prospect approved by the Czech National Bank or these criminals who say we are registered with the Czech National Bank. So uh, it makes sense. The investor cannot find his or her way in his terminology, they must really work hard to find differences in the terminology. So for myself, I would say it would be good to make the terminology more transparent so that the investor knows what is regulated and what is not. So that these entities that are not regulated cannot use this Czech National Bank stamp 
which works, which is the guarantee of protection. On the other hand, yes, we talked about liability for investing. I think it is set very low in our country. The trading companies do not bear any liability for bad advice. The traders, well, we as investors, we should review and think what we invest in, but who we close to deal with. This is as important as the actual investment product. When we negotiate with someone, then we should at least after the meeting to make a background check on them, not just the person, but also the company. The Internet offers discussion forums where we could find information. Or we can just ask, how long have you been doing this job to start a human interview to find things out? And when we have found out that it's somebody new offering this product for one month or two only, then maybe we should turn to somebody more experienced and ask them. The, the right financial consultant should not just be remunerated for selling the product to you. But that's the case. They are just selling, and there is the remuneration from the selling. But actually, the right consultant should also build up a name, reputation, and a client portfolio. And that can be done only thanks to long-term fair communication, warnings of risks, selling products only he or she believes are right and with these people we should communicate and when we are not certain and we are interested in a in an investment product we can call the competitor or we can call a different trader and ask for their opinion so we should seek this information from several resources because one trader's opinion may be distorted and not objective but there are of course traders who are objective and really do try to do their job as good as possible thank you very much i'm going to look around and see if there are questions from the audience yes there is one question so please wait for the microphone to come to you Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask directly. I found out many interesting things regarding regulation and whether there is a need for stronger regulation. Me personally, I see a different issue in this respect. We heard about the possibility to make some savings for your retirement when investing. I don't like that with the support of the government, I can only invest in pension funds because they are quite expensive. There is only 1% of the volume of shares if those are share-based funds. And I missed the opportunity or possibility to invest in individual shares with the support of the government of the state, such as is this, such as the situation in the United States, for example. And of course, know-how is my protection. I can pick the shares myself. I can enter those shares in my portfolio, of course, under certain conditions that I can't sell the shares before the deadline and I would be interested to hear if I can see this opportunity to be realistic if that should be the case. Of course, this suggestion to invest for the retirement came 
by us in the year 2015 already we made this proposal and now it already reached the stage that it's at the Ministry of Finance and is waiting for approval. So it should be effective from 2024 on. Mr. Krochak mentioned that correctly, that this type of product was called long-term investment. Now it's going to be called pension fund. And it's going to be the third pillar with three products. There will be pension funds, which will have a state support, unlike other products. Then there will be this account and life insurance as well. Those products will have the possibility to get government support when you make savings for your retirement. And those three products will be joined in one group under one name. And in this investment pension funds, you can have shares, you can have investment funds, uh, you can have other regulated instruments and products. Uh, so this should come into force in 2024. And there is political agreement on that. Uh, it's going to be be enforced. Yes, everybody agrees on that. The politicians understand that it's not our point to decide that the second pillar uh, should be the most important part of savings. We, of course, know that it's obvious that the second pillar is necessary, but we need to take some further steps for the third pillar so that people who are interested in making savings for their retirement have more possibilities and a wider portfolio of services so that the, there is more options available. Thank you for the question. Maybe one more question for Mr. Krochak, because CNB gets a lot of questions from the media. Why did you allow to go this large company to go bankrupt? Why didn't you protect the clients? Why do you allow this type of business to continue? So what can you supervise? What can you allow? What can you influence? What is in your power? Thank you very much. I think I partly answered this question already. We can only use the scope of our competence. Quite often we hear those reproaches regarding, for example, bonds and losses coming from bonds. But we should realize that Czech National Bank does not supervise the activity of uh, entities that are registered by Czech National Bank. We can't actively intervene in their activities. I can't really remember seeing something similar in five or six years. I don't think that there was a huge bankrupt bankruptcy case of a renowned company. I mean, on the capital market, a company that would really pull down the investors. The case of uh, people under Act 15 that I already uh, mentioned, this is a different area of activity. But regarding further regulation, we are not very, uh, in, very much in favor of more regulation because now already we are very busy and uh, we hear a lot about regulation. We are a part of the European space. And the regulation comes from the European Union to us. And of course, to, due to transposition of various European regulations, they enter our Czech legislation as well. So quite often, national legislation does not have any power and we need to follow the European directives that come to us from Brussels. And of course, they also include a, a list of sanctions and who's going to supervise entities on the capital market. Of course, it's Czech National Bank, but you should not have those high expectations that we need to increase the supervision provided by us. Of course, we need to understand that there are two worlds, the regulated world and the non-regulated world. We, of course, can intervene in the regulated world, but we have no power of intervening in the non-regulated world. 
So maybe it should be our task to make it clearer to the investors that they are entering this non-regulated market. That could be the biggest or the most efficient protection of clients. If they are tempted by some unrealistic promises, uh, maybe that would be the only warning that could help. You should always realize that there is a correlation between risk and proceeds. The bigger the potential profit is, the bigger or the higher the risk. Of course, the capital market works in this way. Thanks God, because this is very interesting. But of course, you need to consider this and be aware of that. Well, I'm asking this because one of the questions that came uh, through Slido asks about those tipsters, those people passing on shady contacts to uh, products that they do not offer themselves. So the tipsters. When we talk about regulation in this area, we hear that the regulation is stronger and stronger. When, for example, you provide licenses to some entities, but those tipsters still have room for manipulation. They, they still can be active on the market. So should we intervene in this respect against tipsters? Could CNB do something about that? Well, we do not create the legislation. And in the case of tipsters, in general, we should say that there are maybe well, there are maybe 15,000 entities on the capital market. We should realize that first. And not all of them are bad, not at all. But we are talking about the risks here. We are not talking about this big majority group that's dominant and that's very positive and we should praise those people. However, regarding the tipsters, we of course, do not have the possibility when we do not have the report or protocol from a negotiation to intervene. And now at this moment, we are questioning ourselves whether we should record negotiations. It used to be a part of legislation. Uh, no, it, it maybe if it could be a part of the legislation, we can't agree on that even in the Czech National Bank, whether it is appropriate to record the phone calls and then the personal meetings. And unless we reach a consensus, it's not clear. In the past, it was possible for us to use recordings to impose sanctions on traders on some criminal, criminal acts. And unless we have this basic tool, we can't really do much. So this is something that is subject to internal discussion in CNB. And if we should have recordings available, I think this should really lead to a stronger protection of our clients. Well, I have to say that quite often the clients record the meetings themselves. And sometimes you will be very surprised to hear the promises of the traders. So maybe recordings would help us. That would be one of the tools that could change something. But to change the legislation, to get rid of the tipsters completely, that's really difficult. This is a gray zone in our legislation and it's hard to change it, honestly. Thank you very much for your answer. And now I would like to ask Mrs. Brodani. We keep talking about some problematic products all the time that we should be careful. Of course, the times are difficult and people who did not invest in the past begin investing now, even if they don't have the specific know-how. Are there any safe investments nowadays? that would offer some reasonable interest rates. There are reasonable investments and safe investments, but I'm not going to tell you the specific type, a brand of sneakers or a brand of car. I didn't expect that from you, no. Well, there is a type of safe investment, a regular and long-term investment. Of course, it sounds like a cliche, but that's the point. If I want earn money now very fast 
or 20 percent next year. Uh, I can't really tell you what to do about it. Well, this is about the pro protection of the long-term investment when we talk about investments in real estate, for example. You've mentioned this investment and many people use conservative ways of investing, maybe in form of mutual funds or some uh, construction savings or household savings. And if there is no ongoing state support, maybe this is not going to be as popular as it was until now. But what is the way to invest in the long term safely? Well, quite honestly, if you are asking whether there is something that can beat the inflation, there are not many ways. But this is just an answer to your question. We should ask ourselves, or should we ask ourselves how to beat the inflation? Or are we asking about the preservation of the value of our assets? Those are two different questions because you are now entering a specific time frame and investing. Not just today I'm going to pick all my money and invest them in one asset. No, I will make a long term plan. So this is a way to protect myself from inflation as well because this is going to be developing in time. And I know this does not sound very popular. I can't provide you with a quick fix. I can't really tell you, choose this product. This is going to make you more money and you should not be afraid of inflation. But if we would have such a simple solution, I'm not really quite sure if we would be a part of reality nowadays. So I can't really answer you uh, and mention a specific type of product that would protect your investment. But of course, there is a way to protect your assets in the long term. However, if you want to earn a lot of money in the short term, I think many people will give you a lot of advice, but uh, that's not my case. And I would not follow the advice myself. We talked about cryptocurrencies, which are not subject to regulation or almost to minor regulation. And many people failed completely when buying cryptocurrencies. There is a lot of volatility in uh, the development of cryptocurrency rates. What would you recommend, Mrs. Moravtsova, when working with cryptocurrencies? Do you think that this is an interesting product also, when we consider what Mrs. Brodani mentioned, that this could be a short-term profit, or can it be very risky? Well, just take a look at the development of the graphics. The cryptocurrency value can go up and can go down very quickly. You can see both directions. For quite a long time, the development went up only. The curve was only rising. But cryptocurrencies in general, that's something new. That's something that we don't know much about. It's something that it's not regulated at all. And when we like this type of product, we really have to decide that investing in something new that not been, that's not been proven yet, and I can't be sure about the outcome, a product that's not regulated. So what does it mean? Is this a certain investment or is it an investment with a big question mark? I think that we all realize that. And I think that the story of cryptocurrency is no longer going to be that relevant because cryptocurrencies were a topic before the inflation. If you remember, we had a long term stagnating interest rates. And at the time, people really wanted to find a product that could offer them profit. There were so many funds and so many products uh, on the capital market that uh, could earn you maybe 0% uh, or close to zero. And now cryptocurrencies offered you more proceeds. Sometimes people think that 
if they enter this unregulated world or they try out something new, something that's not proven yet, they will discover a miracle solution, that they will find a solution that will bring them a lot of money. Fortunately, nowadays, cryptocurrencies are not that strong anymore because the interest rates are rising as well. And you see that people who bought cryptocurrencies for a low price are leaving cryptocurrencies as well nowadays because they see that there are other products and other assets where they can earn more because the interest rates are rising as well, of course. And cryptocurrencies are only alternative investment. <coughs> And even the word itself, alternative, shows us that this is something outside the scope of stability. This is something different, alternative investment. And I think that everyone who wants to make such an investment needs to be sure that if they want to try it out, they can learn something new from it. But if you want to make such an investment and put all your assets in it, and expect to earn a lot of money very fast. I think that this approach is very problematic in the end. One question is about investment questionnaires. Do they work in practice and what are the biggest gaps or weak points of the questionnaires? They work in practice when they have the right design. Unfortunately, there's quite a lot of liberty when creating those questionnaires, and each entity has a different setting of the of the investment process and criteria. They have a different target group, they have a different target product, but there are, of course, questionnaires that are being defined in the right way. What is the weakest point of such questionnaires is that Quite a lot of questionnaires rely on the self-evaluation of the client. And sometimes the questions can be quite suggestive. When the clients do not want to look stupid, they answer in the way that the questionnaire almost forces the client to answer. So the investment tools are quite often related to a highest fee for the trader. So, uh, and sometimes the questionnaire wants to convince you that this is the best product for you. It's quite manipulative. So the questions can be very manipulative and suggestive, and I can see the risk in the self-evaluation of the client as well. Sometimes in the questionnaire you see a similar question that is repeated twice or three times, asking about the same information where the provider of the investment service should verify that the answer of the client is really this and not that. How are financial consultants remunerated? Because this is a subject of one of the next questions. Of course, they want to maximize their profit. Maybe this type of profit is the risk itself. Maybe if the councils or consultants would be paid per hour rate, maybe this could lead to an improvement, Mrs. Brodani. Of course, there are also financial consultants that are being remunerated on hourly rate and not in form of premiums. But of course, let's get back to reality. The majority of investments do not start by waking up one morning and deciding, I'm going to make an investment. I'm going to take a look at the products. I'll define my family budget, how much I can invest. Well, we probably have the idea that this does not work this way, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. It does not work in this way. The investment process starts by coming to the bank or by seeing a consultant who asks you, what do you do with your money? How do you invest? I can see that you have a certain amount of money that you could invest. So you really need to have this financial awareness even before making the investment. And I think that's the difference. This is what makes us different from the more developed part of Europe. 
if I should follow up on Mr. Krochak, who says that the biggest protection of the client is the know-how, I would also say it's know-how and experience of the client, because uh, this prevents you from being tricked. However, you really need to try out investing by yourself. And of course, there are some financial consultants, there are maybe hundreds of them, and I think that you can make your pick, you can make your choice. But when we talk about majority population, I think that we really need to lead the majority population and we need to educate the majority population. And of course, the consequence of this is the system of premiums as a remuneration. Once when everyone starts investing, they can try it out when people will see how the investments look like after one or two or three years, when it can be, for example, 300 crowns a month as a starting investment. After a few years, you can see how volatile the market can be and the situation is going to change with time. Now at this moment, people do not have a family budget. Most of the people do not manage their money in a rational way. That's the case. Maybe one more thing. When you already invest, quite often you decide what to do and how to invest. And quite often your motivation is not common sense. It's emotion, maybe fear of the unknown. And this is what we are experiencing quite often in our economy. We don't know how high the inflation will be. We don't know what the impact from the neighboring countries is going to be, if it's going to impact the shares and bonds. The war in Ukraine is going to impact us as well. So how does the share market and bond market behave after the conflict between Russia and Ukraine erupted? Can you already see a worsening situation when it comes to your investments? Do people already sell their products at a very inconvenient price? Is the panic already there? What do you think, Mrs. Moravtsova? Well, regarding the development on the market, bond markets and bonds in general are rising at this moment because the basic interest rates are growing. And this is reflected in corporate bonds and state bonds as well. So now I think what we are going to see very soon is this offer, yes, you can beat inflation with bonds with an interesting profit option because you can see several types of such bonds on the market. We haven't mentioned yet that there are several web portals where you can buy such small share commissions or bonds. I don't know if it's important or useful to mention them here because you can buy bonds online and uh, you can sometimes see on the website promotion or prospect approved by CNB. And this is something that could seem to be interesting from the point of view of potential risks. Because last time I took, took a look, there were bonds with the proceeds of 10, 15 percent, which is quite high. And of course, the prospect has to be approved uh, to be able to be visible online. But of course, the asset market is not quite interesting at this moment because uh, the increasing interest rates are quite contradictory now at this moment. That's the main rule. When the interest rates go up, the shares go down. That is why it was the other way around in the past years. And regarding the investors, there is another question. Sometimes you can have the feeling that something is going on and you have to respond to protect your property. Maybe uh, you can miss the opportunity, but this is not the right emotion. You should not 
be led by such an emotion to make an investment. You should decide based on your knowledge and based on your belief that you got after studying some documents. And uh, in this case, when you want to leave an investment, that's quite important as well. We should mention that. It's very important that once you make an investment, you should also ask how to end the, the investment. How can you quit? Even if it's a long-term investment, you should always ask about this. Of course, you need to consider the time frame of the investment and choose the right product. But even with a long time frame and long-term investment, you always need to ask, how can I quit? What are the conditions? Who's going to buy this product from me when I want to quit? Because many things can happen. It can be personal things. You need money or you don't like it, you want to sell these instruments. So it is very important to know how you can exit. Yeah, Mrs. Bradani, we published a report on Monday for the third quarter regarding the investments development in fund. There, We don't see any panic purchases. On the contrary, we see big purchases of bonds and short-term bonds. So I think and hope this is the consequence of us teaching the people invest on a regular basis. We could see it for the first time in 2020 when the corona crisis broke out that you would expect, like always until then, that there will be huge panic purchases like to, in 2008. It did not happen. And during the coming two years, people could enjoy pretty nice returns on their investments. So I hope those who already have invested have some experience with markets that can be volatile and if they have a longer horizon they will not let panic break out. We are s coming to the end of the meeting. Please speak to the microphone. Tomasz Karczyk, hello. My question was to Mr. Krochak, I was wondering about the growth of qualified investors. Is there a clarification for that? And do you see a risk in the growth of this type of investment? I think the clarification lies in the popularization of the investments. The fund of qualified investors is less fixed in the regulation. They have broader investment options from closed funds where we too can buy a shopping mall and this is what we can do and we can purchase more assets. There is a lot of funds investing in pretty interesting assets like paintings, arts, historical cars, archive wines, they have interesting investment strategies and plans. And then there are open funds where if accepting the terms and conditions and the investment strategy where any qualified investor may enter, anybody who reaches that stage, the limit is 1 million or it can be 3 million for the stricter ones. So the attractiveness is growing and the term qualified investor has been here since 2011 or 12. Of course, at that time, one million was a different amount of money than today. So the opportunity to invest in interesting assets, dynamic assets, also a bit aggressively, is one thing. And the limit is not that high for so many investors. Quite a lot of people have one million crowns. If you have a studio in a housing estate, you have about three, 
or 4 million crowns in that. So if you see any risks, no. These are qualified investors who have met regulatory conditions. And as for system risks from a failure, thanks to the big diversity they are investing in, no, we don't see that for the market. Thank you. And the last question. Hi, Lukáš Marek. I would like to... Well, not much has been said on the limit, on the boundary where the supervision ends and where the personal responsibility of the investor starts. So I would like to ask Mr. Kročák and Frau Mrs. Brodani, where do you see this boundary? Let me give you a short example. In one decision of the Czech National Bank, there was a complaint that an instrument was sold to a participant with a possible loss of 100%, even though he or she did not tick this box. M maybe the, this may be only a small part of the port portfolio. So where is the boundary between the responsibilities? How far does the oversight reach? I don't know this specific case. The, the boundary is not fixed, that there will be like a line on the ground which you cross, then it's yours, or here before the line we should still intervene. The Czech National Bank is a public supervision institution, and we make sure that entities on the market treat their clients with all due care and meet their regulatory conditions placed on them. We have, we can force them, that is our role. We mentioned some examples of maybe not good financial management. Of course, the investor bears the risk. He or she must choose and as already said, they should also check the information. If there is somebody who insured my cottage, it doesn't mean that I can fully trust this person. The investor must know and check the information from multiple resources. There was this question of emotions. I don't think that emotions belong to business. You may buy a brand T-shirt with emotions, but not when investing your all life savings. You must not respond when somebody says, buy it now, do it now, do it quickly. So this boundary is hard to find. Maybe there are overlaps, but the investor plays the key role. He or she decides about his or her money and also on different levels. It's all the way to the asset management and consultancy, and there is there are more stages. There are commands and orders, and the counterparty has certain rights and duties towards you. So you need to check this out and see in what role you deal with me. Are you in providing investment consultancy, are you going to betray me? So this is what we need to realize, what these people are obliged to do towards you. I, I agree. This is also for the regulated entities. It's the client must assess himself or herself, if the advice is good, if the trader is okay to talk to. But from the point of view of the regulated market, it's a bit that like that the Czech National Bank marks the line. And if there is something not right in the investment questionnaire, 
the entities know that they must not do it. So there is a certain will regarding certain principles that are not fully defined, like this portfolio approach is not fully governed by legislation. There are no clear rules, but the supervision of the Czech National Bank as part of its legal comp competencies is pretty broad. It can say what is and what is not professional care, but that again is a very broad term. So yes, there are certain options. The investor may also purchase a product that does not match his or her profile, but they must declare it clearly that they are aware of the risk, that they are purchasing something they are not supposed to purchase, and it must be document, documented somewhere. This is possible. Nevertheless, regarding the product governance, it should not happen that the mediator offers the product. If the client comes with the product that he saw this kind of offer somewhere and he's asking the trader to provide this, then yes, under the terms mentioned. But it should not happen that it is offered by the client from the broker. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much for your answers. I hope we threw more light into several topics. Many topics remained open. It may be the next discussion forum of the Czech National Bank that will be held here at this Masaryk University and the Faculty of Economics and Administration. So thank you for coming and you will find a lot of advice to investors also among these commandments. You can find it on the association's website and keep calm and don't make decisions based on your emotions. And please seek advice from somebody you trust, from somebody who has been in the business for a long time and can show results. So I wish you to be careful and not throw yourself into anything what would cause you trouble. Thank you for co-shaping the discussion. Many questions remained unanswered. I'm sorry for that. There was not enough room. But as promised on the Czech National Bank website, we will try and the panelists will try to answer all the questions asked, all the questions that could not be answered. So thank you for your participation. Thank you for following our stream and have a good day. Goodbye.